Hello and welcome. As you can tell by the title, I'm the Obsessed Movie Man. Oh man, it's the 75th anniversary of Batman, so I'm going to review something Batman related. There are so many movies to choose from, I just couldn't decide what to review. So, I let Great Scott choose for me. He's coming over bringing the Dark Knight with him, and I cannot tell you how excited I am to review this. Obsessed Movie Man. Mr. Freeze, you're in my apartment. That's so cool. Was that a pun? No. No, it wasn't. Um, what are you doing here? I want you to review Batman and Robin. Well, a lot of critics have already reviewed Batman and Robin, so there's not a whole lot left for me to say. You will review it. Or else. Or else what? All right, old man. Here's your copy of The Dark Knight. Hey, I know you, don't I? Yeah, you're that funny freeze guy. Looks like I'm going to have to review Batman Robin. I wish there was something unique I could bring to this review that hasn't been said before. Wait. I do. Let's review this. We'll get the history out of the way first. Tim Burton made the first modern age Batman film in 1989 starring Michael Keane as Batman. Burton and Keane returned for the sequel, Batman Returns, which horrified many critics and passing viewers. Wanting these films to be more marketable, Burton was taken off the Batman wagon and replaced with Joel Schumacher. Keane also left it for the third film, Batman Forever, Val Kilmer played Batman. Immediately, fans and critics saw that the films began to get really campy, even homaging the 60s Adam West TV show a few times. Finally, we arrive at this stinker. Here's a review I'm sure you have never seen before. This is Batman and Robin. The film opens with a gothic choir and a cool scene of Batman, played by George Clooney, and Robin, played by Chris O'Donnell, suiting up. They face the Batmobile and the music suddenly stops. Oh no, they're gonna say something stupid just like in Batman Forever, aren't they? Robin looks at Batman and says that he wants his own car, to which Batman responds, this is why Superman works alone. What does one say to something so terribly written? I can't believe that he just said that. It's one of the most unfunny comic book jokes I've ever heard. Hell, it's one of the worst jokes that I've heard in general. So our heroes head to the Gotham Museum, where they plan on stopping the diabolical and cold-hearted Mr. Freeze, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, from stealing a diamond. Wow, Mr. Freeze is in this film! This is awesome! We get to see one of Batman's most tragic and sympathetic villains, and we're gonna showcase his tragic backstory. This is awesome! I can't wait to see how he turns out in this film. Oh, what have they done to you, Mr. Freeze? He's no longer stoic, he's no longer unemotional, but now he's just as bad as Two-Face from Batman Forever. The worst aspects by far, however, are the ice puns. In fact, how many ice puns are there? Yes, yes, as every other reviewer has said about this movie, Mr. Freeze speaks entirely in ice puns. Keep in mind, those are 29 ice puns that Mr. Freeze says. I'm not counting the ones that Batman, Robin, and Batgirl say. They're just so hard to listen to, and yet, the king of catchphrases, Arnold Schwarzenegger, is saying them. Even he can't stay with the stupidity of these lines. Oh god, they hurt! Ah! Jeez, they're terrible! My acting has less ham than these jokes! After an intense game of ice hockey at the museum, No, I'm not joking, they do play ice hockey with a diamond, Mr. Freeze manages to escape. We then cut to an evil lab in some remote jungle and are introduced to Pamela Isley, played by Uma Thurman, who is a very nerdy botanist. She discovers that her boss has a side job for breeding superhumans. Yes, in this version, Dr. Woodrow is the one who creates Bane. I'm dreading to see what Bane looks like in this film. Ah! I'm sorry, Joel. Bane is not a dumbed-down version of Lou Ferrigno. He is supposed to be just as smart as Batman, or at least have the IQ of an eight-year-old. My god! Did anyone do any research on Bane before putting him in this damn movie? Anyway, Isley is discovered and Woodrow seemingly kills her by knocking a whole bunch of chemicals on her. How much you guys want to bet that she has some crazy superpowers now? Meanwhile, at the Batcave, the 60s theme is affecting me. Batman and Robin uncover archive footage of Victor Freeze and we learn his tragic backstory about his wife being frozen due to an illness that he could not cure. Something awful happens in the lab and he becomes Mr. Freeze. This irritates me for two reasons. One. Looking back at this whole story, this is exactly like Batman Forever. A new villain emerges in the intro while we set up our second nerdy villain. Then we cut the footage of the first vil villain becoming the villain. It's the exact same thing as the last one. Two, are you seriously trying to gain sympathy from the audience after showcasing Mr. Freeze in this film? 
Maybe it would have worked if for the rest of the movie he stopped with the jokes, but the very next scene that he is in, he's trying to get his henchmen to sing Mr. White Christmas while wearing polar bear slippers. What do they do then? They cut to his frozen wife, reminding the audience that we're supposed to feel sorry for him. Choose what you want your character to be, a tragic villain or a walking punchline, because damn it, he certainly can't be both! It seems I've skipped a bit. Isley comes back, big shocker, and kills Woodrow with a poisonous kiss. Thus the seductive Poison Ivy is born. Enough of that though, here's another plot point. Barbara Wilson, played by Alicia Silverstone, the niece of the butler Alfred, played by Michael Goff, stops by to visit her uncle because of his failing health. I'll give the movie this, I actually found this to be an intriguing subplot. Bruce Willis lose the last of his family if Alfred dies. I don't think Alfred has had such a bigger role in the Batman movies until the Nolan trilogy came around. We also have some very good acting from the always talented Michael Goff. Poison Ivy makes her rather impressive debut at a charity ball that Batman and Robin happen to be attending. People are bidding on women to date, but when Ivy shows up, not only do the Gotham men bid on her, so do Batman and Robin. And here is where we are introduced to the infamous Bat credit card. I feel like I've seen this before. Not just because I've seen the movie, but this scene in particular seems really familiar. It's as if I've seen the destruction of one man's life be destroyed because of this one scene. As if it drove him completely insane. I don't know who that person is, but all I can say is I agree with him. The bad credit card is really stupid. Freeze shows up to steal another diamond, but Batman catches him and sends him off to Arkham. Robin complains because he's Robin. I mean because Batman doesn't trust Robin being his partner. Crime fighting partner, that is. All too soon, Poison Ivy and Bane break Mr. Freeze out of Arkham and begin working together to take down the dynamic duo. Damn it! It still sounds like I'm referencing the Adam West show. Batman and Robin come across Ivy at Freeze's hideout, and we see Ivy seduce Robin to the point where he can no longer bring logic or reason to his mind. Then again, he never could, so not much has changed. Ivy escapes, and Robin decides to break up with Batman. I mean, fly solo. Before meeting up with Freeze, Ivy literally pulls the plug on Mr. Freeze's wife and tells Freeze that it was Batman who did it. His reaction at first seems like a nice tribute to the animated series, but then, Mr. Freeze is turned into a stereotype villain who vows to take over the world. Ivy furthers the lunacy, stating that they will be the only living humans on the planet, and they will rule over a bunch of tiny Audrey Twos. What? No love for Bane, Ivy? Freeze plans on turning the giant Gotham City telescope into an ice cannon so he can freeze Gotham. Ivy tries to separate Robin from Batman so much so that she actually creates a Robin signal in the sky. Again, not at all like the Riddler altering the Bat signal in the last film. Bruce rationally tries to explain to Dig that he's under her influence, but sadly the annoying bird boy won't stop complaining. Bruce finally shuts him up by reminding him of family and trust, whoop to frickin' do. Batman and Robin find Ivy and try to take her down, but sadly the bride from Kill Bill kicks their butts. Then along came Batgirl. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to speak about this. Sorry, the plot was so engaging. I completely forgot to bring up that Barbara takes on the mantle of Batgirl after Alfred creates her a suit. So Batgirl and Ivy fight, and Ivy stupidly admits that she tried killing Nora Freeze. Batgirl defeats Ivy, who literally does shout out, Curses. Can this get any cheesier? On second thought, don't answer that. The trio make their way to the Gotham Observatory, just as Mr. Freeze begins to freeze Gotham. Batgirl and Robin take down Bane, which is a shame I was hoping that he would break all their backs. Then again, I refuse to admit that this even is Bane. Batman defeats Mr. Freeze in the most powerful way. By making his own damn heat puns. Freeze is defeated and Batman shows video recording that he just happened to film of Ivy admitting that she tried to kill Nora Freeze. Batman tells Freeze that she is safe and will be moved to Arkham so he can continue doing his research. He also asks Freeze for a sample of the cure so that he can give it to Alfred. I'll elaborate on this. It turns out that Alfred had an earlier stage of the same di disease that Nora had. Freeze has a cure for the earlier stage, but not for the stage that Nora is in. That's why he never could use the cure. I hope I cleared that up. Freeze is redeemed, giving Batman the cure, and he is then moved to Arkham, where he becomes Ivy's soulmate, and vows to make her life a living hell, all filled with puns. Alfred is saved, Barbara says that she will stay as Batgirl, and the cheesiest line is given to Alfred, who proclaims, We're going to need a bigger cave. Then the movie finally ends. Praise the Lord, it's over. For a movie like this, I figured that the best way to review it was to go over the whole story, so you can see how ludicrous it is. The acting is extremely hammy, the costumes look ridiculous, seriously, bat nipples? And the ice puns get really old, really fast. In its attempt at paying respects to the Adam West TV show, Batman and Robin inadvertently made itself goofier than the actual show. This is the 
worst thing that has Batman attached to it. I can't find any redeeming thing about this movie. That's not true. Scott, weren't you frozen? It's cool. I thought. Now, there is something that makes this movie memorable to you, old man. What do you mean? You know. This was the first Batman film that you had ever seen. No, no, I um, grew up with the Tim Burton film and then I watched the animated series. Yeah, that's it. No, it was this one. Come on, come on, admit it. <sighs> yes, Batman and Robin was the first piece of anything Batman related that I was introduced to. It didn't take long for me to figure out what Batman was really like though, but for the time, I found myself entertained by the corny jokes, the colorful costumes, the dumb story, everything. I loved Mr. Freeze when I was a kid, not knowing that I would eventually come to love the animated version of Mr. Freeze even more. Do I still love this film? Yes and no. No, because I admit that this is a far departure from what Batman represents, and that this is a really bad movie in general. Yes, because it's a fun bad movie to watch. As long as you go into this movie knowing full well that the film is going to be full of dumb slapstick, I don't really think that one needs to be mad at it forever. I even think that Joel Schumacher was a good sport about all this. For someone who is credited at killing Batman in films, he at least has acknowledged his mistakes and has publicly apologized, apologized for the film multiple times. I think that says a lot about a director when he freely admits that he was wrong. Now can I end this, Scott? There is one more redeeming thing about this movie, obsessed movie man. One more thing. What else is there? Really, Scott? A music video? A really bad music video? Don't pull disrespect at all, Kelly! This is a masterpiece, damn it! It actually is kinda cashy. Hell yeah, it is! I just wish I could review The Dark Knight. Yeah, review The Dark Knight. You have two copies? Why do you have two? Why don't you have two copies? It's The Dark Knight. Good point. Next review, The Dark Knight.